introduce myself. I am currently uh, attached to a blue team. Um, I, in the past, I, well, I call myself a reformed red teamer because I, I spent most of my time doing red team. Um, I've done pen testing for, for years, mostly um, on the public sector uh, for the US government, uh, Department of Defense. Um, I've done a fair amount of training. I, I taught a lot of courses for the US Navy, uh, for Department of Defense. Um, did some time at the NSA, that's where I went after school. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, like, what's my history? I, I did the typical um, MIS degree from, from Utah State, then I went on to Idaho State. From there, joined the government, um, worked for NSA for, for a number of years, and then moved on to government contracting from there and, and did a bunch of different things, um, training, pen testing, that sort of thing. Um, now I, I work for Stage 2 Security. Um, we do a lot of, of fun things there. Um, anything from pen testing to defense to, um, you know, security engineering, that sort of thing. So you name it, um, I probably have my hands in it in some way. Um, so this is my own talk, just a disclaimer. It doesn't necessarily reflect the views of my employer, but they definitely support it. Um, so the question is why JavaScript malware? You know, it's, it's not, not all that exciting. You know, you, you look at people like Wayland who do, do reverse engineering of, of real life malware. Um, so why, why JavaScript? And, and it, this came from a two-pronged approach. Um, the first is JavaScript malware is everywhere. So, you know, it makes threat hunting really easy if you have so many targets to look at. You know, I, you can take a look at a bunch of sites and any given day, you know, a quarter of them have some sort of JavaScript malware on them, especially when you're talking about e-commerce sites. Um, reverse engineering isn't necessary. You know, I, I haven't broken out IDA Pro in, in a number of years now. Um, and I've gotten a little rusty. And so, you know, reverse engineering JavaScript malware is a thousand times easier. You know, they, they try to obfuscate it, but there's, there's a lot of tools out there that, that can help you with that. Um, if these slides are shared, I've got a bunch of links here um, talking about JavaScript malware, um, battles between rival gangs, um, trying to get malware on, on systems. Um, a company that we'll talk a little bit later, Sansec, is, is a, a leader in this. So e-commerce, what brings us up? You know, this time of year, there's a, a lot of e-commerce malware. Um, you know, e-commerce is, is big biz, business this time of year. Everybody's shopping online. Everybody's looking for, you know, Christmas gifts. So, you know, this, this means that the attackers are there as well because they know they can, they can gather that information. So we have these people shopping online. We have the attackers in there. Um, you know, traditionally, we, we've been a reactive group towards this. You know, we, we detect malware, the merchant gets um, notified, and then you respond. So you, you do IR, you reverse engineer the malware, you figure out what happened. Um, I wanted to be a little more proactive at it. So that's what, what started this whole project. So if, if anybody's worked for, for a merchant before, they probably, you've probably seen this, this kind of letter. You know, it goes along the lines of saying, you know, your account has a lot of fraudulent transactions. You need to do something about it or we're going to shut you down. So let's first talk about what a zero dollar ver verification is. Zero dollar is a, a whole place. Um, you used to see it as a one dollar transaction, but they've gotten, gone away from that and done zero dollar. Um, what does this mean? Why does it matter? So, you know, if it's zero dollars, what do you care as a, a merchant? Uh, what this is, is carters are, are out there, and when you're selling on the black market, you can have what are known as verified or unverified cards. If you have a, a list of verified cards, you can sell those for, for way more, um, you know, 10 times the amount per, um, per card over unverified. So what these attackers do is they, the carters will take their list that they've stolen and they go through and they find a site that has, has a weakness. And they'll go through 
and they'll authorize transactions. So they'll go to buy something uh, with the intention of immediately canceling. They just want to know the card works. Um, and then they take those lists and they sell them as verified. And usually there's some sort of like buyback policy. So, you know, if if they're, the cards aren't valid, then they have they have to buy them back for a certain amount of money. Um, so it's in their best interest as as black market sellers to have verified cards because they can sell for more and they don't have to deal with returns. So where do these come from? You know, they, they don't necessarily indicate a breach on your, your site. Um, if you're a merchant that has this sort of thing happen, you know, a huge amount or a spike of, of zero dollar verifications, um, it probably just means that your payment process is weak. Um, you're missing something in, in the steps that will, will prevent bot activity from verifying these because, you know, they're not going in there manually. They wrote a script to go through, test the card, add it to their list. Um, and it's, it's not a zero cost for you as a merchant either. A lot of payment processors um, will charge a fee um, for verification transactions that don't complete. So if they complete, they charge you their normal rates, you know, which is a flat fee plus a per percentage of the sale. But verifications, um, especially if you're a repeat offender, um, can, they can charge you up to like 25 cents a transaction. So imagine that if, if a carter targets your site and they test 10,000 cards, you could be pay on the hook for you know, $2,500, which may be your, your revenue if you're a small, a small merchant. So countermeasures for this. You know, you're, you're talking about the typical anti-bot techniques, things that would prevent bots from um, carrying out an action but not limit your human customers from doing it. You know, CAPTCHAs, rate limiting, um, watching for things like shopping cart reuse. So a lot of carters will take and build a shopping cart and then reuse that over and over again for these, you know, 10,000 transactions. Um, watch your trends on, on checkouts. If you suddenly have a lot of checkouts that that don't complete or you know, don't go all the way through the shipping stage or the orders get canceled immediately after. You know, that's a, typically a sign of, of this sort of activity. Um, you know, uh, typically, a zero dollar ver verification means that you're, you're authorizing the card, um, but you're not going to charge until a later date. This is common for um, when you charge the card when, when the, the product ships. Um, so if you can avoid $0 ver verifications altogether, you know, that's all the better if you can just charge immediately. Um, but of course, you know, that depends on, on your, your, um, your site and how you operate. The second one we're going to talk about, um, this, is, this is the one that we, we're actually interested in today. Um, this one is, um, the payment processor or a bank has aggregated a list of stolen cards. So that all these banks get together and they share this stolen card data. And then they start looking at transactions. And when they find transactions that match between all of these stolen cards, then they decide that that must be the culprit. And they're usually fairly accurate um, because we're talking about huge data sets here. So all these payment processors, they get together, they, they figure out who has the, the common transaction? You know, where were all these cards used um, before the, they were exposed? And then it's the same sort of thing. They talk to the processor, so the processing bank, and then the processing bank turns to the merchant and says, hey, you, know, you, you need to fix this, otherwise we're canceling your account. So this is just a summary of, of our difference here. Uh, we're looking at stolen cards versus somebody trying to verify stolen cards. Um, most of these are, are almost always a, an indication of some sort of compromise. Whether it's they've compromised, compromised the payment processor, they've compromised your site, they've compromised some sort of database on the back end. Um, it's almost always indication of some sort of breach in the chain and whether that's your fault or the payment processor's fault. You know, some of these on the hook for it.
pretty common targets, especially um, when we're talking about e-commerce, are the major players out there. So we're talking about things like WooCommerce, which is a WordPress pl um, plugin. It's very common to see um, multiple CVs or multiple um, vulnerability announcements come out for WooCommerce after the holidays, because that's when they discovered them, um, is after the breach. Um, other, other targets are the platforms themselves. So um, lots of the sales as a service type platforms, Shopify, Magento, Demandware, um, you know, if they can compromise the platform, whether it is compromise the credentials, whether it, or it's compromising the platform's back end, um, then they can get at this information. And we're talking about, um, you know, zero day exploits are fairly common to, they'll discover them and hold on to them until the, um, like the holidays or other common high, high um, e-commerce times. So you think about Christmas, um, other holidays where a lot of purchasing takes place, such as Valentine's Day. You know, these are times when these will pop up. You know, they, they may have sat on them for months um, before finally using them. Or they may sit on that access for months. You know, it could be a site's compromised, and then they just sit on it until it, um, the, the right time to enact their plan. And they're pretty smart about it. These are, these are pretty sophisticated groups. They know what they're doing. And then <laughs> to dovetail right in with the, the previous talk, you know, password stuffing, credential reuse. This is extremely common with um, especially the, the sales as a service platforms where it's some mom and pop shop that, that decided they want to, wanted to be online. So they set up an account and they use the same password they always use. And then you know, that's found in a breach and, and sure enough, the, the attackers find it, test it, and then they have access to the, to the site themselves. Um, another um, one that's popped up more recently is um, marketplaces for stolen tokens. So this is kind of an interesting one. They get tokens from you know, a whole bunch of different ways, um, whether it's compromised endpoints, um, stolen data, that sort of thing. Um, there are actually marketplaces that take stolen session cookies um, and sell them to other hackers to use um, in attacks. So basically it's keys to accounts and um, they're being marketed on, the, on these forums to, be, to then be used later um, in enacting these attacks. So our traditional approach to this, this is the, the approach I walked into, um, was first you get a notification. There's some sort of breach, we need to react to it. Um, so you go into IR mode, you hunt down where the breach is, um, figure out what happened, um, you clean off the site as best you can, so that, that means removing whatever malware is there. Um, try to ret return it to a secure state, so that means you have to figure out how they got in in the first place. Um, change passwords, patch, you know, whatever it is, and then return to business as usual. The problem with this is it's entirely reactionary, and um, you have no idea what the time is between um, number five here and returning back to number one and getting a, a new breach notification. And that didn't, didn't sit well with me, um, especially because the steps involved. So, so how do you find malicious code on your site? Especially if you're re relying on third-party providers for a lot of this stuff. You know, do you know every line of code on your site? Do you know exactly what every line of code does and how it affects your site? You know, what about third-party plugins? What about tracking? Um, what if you use an analytics pr uh, platform? What if you use open source dependencies? You know, this was a common one. <laughs> that we saw just recently, there was an NPM package that was compromised, and I, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but there were you know, thousands of sites that were using this single NPM package that um, installed a crypto miner. So you, know, you have so many different points that your site can change, and maybe you don't know about it. Just some examples of, of code we've, we've seen before. Um, so who can tell me what that does? I, I have no idea, this is just a snippet. 
Um, but this is JavaScript code. It's actually part of, um, part of a compromise. And they've gotten really good at obfuscating its purpose. Now this one uses a little bit more plain English, plain, plain English. Um, but even still, it's, it's fairly difficult to spot. And this was inserted into a jQuery library. So that means there was a library file that was several megabytes in size. You know, jQuery is not, not small by any means. And then this little, this little snippet, this is just part of it, uh, was inserted into that library. Here's another example. This one used um, a bunch of strings, which it then reassembled into code later on. So I had a whole bunch of these static um, values here, and then it reassembled it into code later on in, in there. Um, so the, to the casual observer, you know, figuring out what that's doing and, and why it's there is extremely difficult. So this one here was another, another skimmer. Um, it was a little more obvious. Um, you can see right in the middle there that um, push to a URL. So that was actually harvesting data from the site, and then it would just push it to this URL. And then down at the bottom, it actually used a math.random function to generate a slightly random URL um, that it put that data to. Just another example there. This is, was an interesting one as well. Um, it was inserted into Google Analytics code. So a Google Analytics library was um, pulled down from Google, inserted into the page, and then they added their own code to it. So right at the top of the page, you saw copyright 2012 Google. And then um, further on down, there was a function um, within there. You know, who knows what Google Analytics should look like? Who knows that whether Google Analytics code should be on your site versus pulled from you know, Google themselves? So it's fairly easy to, um, on a lot of these to get an idea of what's going on. Um, things like deobfuscate.io can help you reverse engineer what's going on. Um, it, it's not 100% in every case, um, but we don't really need it to be. You know, that when you're looking at these, these types of code here, all you really need to know is that something looks fishy. And once you get used to, or once you see a few samples of these, they all start to, to stick out to you because your JavaScript code on your site is going to look well-formed. It's going to have um, defined functions. It's going to be <laughs> short little um, lines of code rather than these big, long strings. And so once you, once you know what to look for, then it's pretty easy to spot those. And so you don't necessarily need to reverse engineer the whole thing just to figure out what it's doing, what you really need to do is figure out your ind indicators. So you're looking at you know, what domains is it contacting? How is it, what's it doing with the data that it's harvesting? Um, that sort of thing. We don't really care exactly how it's assembling that data to be shipped off. We just care about where it's going and how we can stop it. Um, JS Beautify um, in CyberChef is a good tool, especially if you're dealing with like minified code. Um, you toss it in there, it formats it um, nicely for you so it's much easier to read. So once again, we just need our IOCs. We don't need to understand exactly what happens. But that led me to how can I be proactive? How can I move for, how can I detect these before we get a letter from the payment processors? How can we figure out how to stop this before the, the compromise, or at least minimize the compromise. Um, because after the fact leads to things like loss of reputation or loss of you know, your relationship with the um, payment processor. You may have to move on to a different payment processor if you have too many of these breaches. So we started brainstorming. You know, what can we do? Um, we looked at tracking the domains that are called. You know, a lot of these JavaScript malwares are are pushing data to some um, relatively obscure domain. And so if we can track those, if we track those DNS requests, then maybe we can um, figure out when a site's compromised because they're doing um, strange DNS calls on a regular basis. 
Uh, we talked about using um, Selenium to um, obtain network statistics. So we go to the page, we, uh, we visit the page, and we track every network call that, that happens um, as we go through and process the page. Um, thought about even just using curl and regex, looking for specific keywords. Um, that one didn't work very well because there aren't very many keywords we could use. Uh, we looked at hashing the DOM and just uh, every time the DOM changed on the site, investigating. Um, but you know, with any file integri integrity monitoring, that's you know, lots of false positives, especially when you're dealing with third parties that may update underneath you. Um, an interesting one, um, entropy analysis. So I, I thought, well, maybe I can look at entropy um, because these, <laughs> this malware that we're looking at, um, it looks pretty random to me um, as opposed to regular JavaScript code. But once I started putting the, the samples I had into um, some, some entry, entropy analysis, it actually turned out that um, the entropy was higher on regular JavaScript code from you know, third-party sites versus the, the malware. Um, the malware <laughs> repeated enough um, that it didn't look like it was very random. And so it was, it was actually the opposite I expected. I expected that um, an entropy analysis would take a malicious script and it would immediately flag it as high entropy and, and look very suspicious. But it turned out to be exactly the opposite of what I thought. Um, thread and tell feeds turn out to be not great, um, usually because of the, um, the way these, these people operate, and that is that they bide their time, they wait for the right time to um, drop their, their mal malware, their skimmer code, and then they operate using a, basically a domain per engagement. And so um, once, once that's burned, they don't go back to it. And so usually the thread intel feeds are behind um, several steps behind the, the attackers. So we started down the, the path of Selenium at first. And um, pointing Selenium to the site, analyzing the results, and um, generating um, statistical analysis on that. Um, but it turns out, why, why reinvent the wheel? And this isn't really an, an endorsement of URL scan. It, it's just the tool we ended up using. There's a bunch out there. Um, but urlscan.io has a, an API interface where you can do exactly what we were talking about doing with Selenium, which is we load the site, we parse it, um, we store data about it, and then use that for um, statistical analysis. And it has everything we need there. Um, when you load up a site, it shows you all the domains that are called, all the um, scripts that are loaded, all the IP addresses that are touched, you know, all the various supporting components of the, the site. So if we run URL scan, um, provides us back a JSON um, with everything we need to know. It gives you hashes of all the files it downloads, names, um, you can even grab contents if you want. Um, but I was interested in a few key fields uh, to begin with. And so we started with that. I just used Python and I parsed out the JSON. Um, grabbed the dates, um, the pages obtained, and uh, a page hash. Um, but it, at this point, I, I wasn't quite ready for um, full analysis of it. You know, I, I just wanted to gather statistical data to see if I could prove my point. And it also makes it really easy if you do find something. Um, there's a, an indicators that you can um, pull either from the API or URL scan site that has every possible indicator related to this site. Um, so then you can just go through and pick out the ones that you're interested in. Um, and as a bonus, so a company called Sansect.io, um, they're pretty popular in the e-commerce um, like scanning um, field. They've actually collaborated with um, URL scan to provide um, classification of sites and, and scripts that are pulled in. Um, so they, there's a little bit of thread intel in there, and so far I haven't found it super valuable, but it's you know, a, a bonus you get um, for the, the cost of an API key, which is if you're small volume, it's free. 
And then from there, what we did um, is we actually turned it into a Splunk SOAR or Phantom project. Um, we used Phantom to <laughs> query Splunk, figure out domain names that, um, of sites so we don't have to keep that list up to date, um, and then kick off automated scans from URL scan, pull back the results, and then ingest it back into Splunk for um, our own data analysis. Um, the original backup plan was to use uh, Lambda, Lambda functions to um, kick off the API calls and then pull back the data and store it in S3 and then we'd figure out how to ingest it from there. About midway through this project, um, there was an announcement from, I don't know if you're familiar with him, his name's Scott Helm. Um, he runs reporturi.com. Um, he actually made an announcement about um, they were offering an e-commerce solution. And that included a couple key tools, one called ScriptWatch and one called Content Security Policy. And basically it was designed to do exactly what, what I was intending to do with this project. Um, so, you know, great minds think alike maybe, hopefully. Um, but it, it's a turnkey solution. If, you know, if you don't want to implement this yourself, um, there's definitely companies out there who are doing it. Um, and you can employ them to, to do it for you. Um, leaves you time to deal with the false positives and tuning rather than, you know, building infrastructure and that sort of thing. So, like I said before, this isn't necessarily an endorsement of URL scan, it's just what we found that works well for us. Um, and the intent of this talk was more to demonstrate that the techniques involved with this rather than um, dependency on a specific tool. Um, what I have um, so far, uh, we haven't completed this project. So, uh, so if any of you are working on something similar, um, definitely find me on the um, besides SLC Slack. Um, if you'd like to collaborate, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to share share what I've been working on. Um, we can figure out how to make things better together. Any questions? All right, thank you.